I want you to be an actor. Yes, you're voicing a project, but I need you to be the actor before the voiceover artist. It's an interesting thing. A lot of people are like, I do voices. My friends say I should be a voiceover artist. I'm like, but can you act? My job is to shape the show sonically because my prelay or the nap pause goes to the animators and that's what they animate to. So I'm actually directing the show usually right after the scripts are done, which is sometimes a full year before the animation team gets to work on it. If after your third session with me, you are still where you were at the first session, I gotta jump, I gotta bounce. So I expect my actors to show up and bring it. And that requires some preparation on, on your part. So my job is to shepherd the show from its initial point to its end, to shepherd the characters that way as well, to create specificity in the reads, choices for the animation directors. And it's also really important to me that, that the projects sound like the world. So when I'm casting it, when I'm directing it, I'm trying to create this, this audio tapestry, the sonic variation. So my job as a voice director is to take whatever the vision of the showrunner and the animation director is, make it actable. Hi guys, in case you don't know, we we have our Shaliwa in the house today. Yeah, okay. we And do. in a quick minute, <laughs> we're going to give context. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Decode, how are Take you it today? Away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine, Sarah. Yay! You know what? Like today, I feel so happy for a lot mm. of reasons. But the first one I'm going to mention right now is the fact that it feels so good being on the back seat and letting you like take the host <laughs> mic. Like today, I'm the co-host. <laughs> You're the host. Uh, <laughs> I feel good. I mean, it's, that's not scary at all. You know, no pressure or I nothing. Know, right? <laughs> I know, but right? Especially when you're talking with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, fine. Let the cat out of the bag. Go on. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. Let's still do some suspense for them. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great. Anyway, yeah, let's okay, do it. guys, we are so excited. We're talking with somebody mm -hmm. super, super, super amazing today. And in case you're listening to us for the first time, this is the Everything Voiceovers podcast. And you have I, Sarah Johnson, and mm -hmm. T-Code to look back, Kaladi, your host Yay. on the podcast. <laughs> yes, this is that podcast to listen to to hear everything about voiceover to learn and just hear insights and expand your perspective on everything that goes on in the voiceover world. And today, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we have <laughs> the awesome, the one, the only, our very own Shali Wa. Come <laughs> <laughs> on, <Mon> Wilson! <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I need to like shrink that that intro and put it in my pocket and I'll just whip it out on low self-esteem days and be like, hey, Thank you. That was very kind. Why? Thank you so much for being here, Paula. Like, we're so excited to have you on the Thank podcast. You. That's very I cool. mean, uh, I have goosebumps. I'm so excited. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, me, I'm just going to jump right into it because there's so many questions I've had in my head for you okay. <laughs> for a while. Okay. <laughs> right? So, you have this incredible work ethic. <laughs> Your time management is. <laughs> Mind blowing. Okay, thank you. I'm like, how is she able to do this and do this and do this? I remember you sent a mail once to the Ianu cast, and <clears throat> you were talking about how I, I can't remember the the context, but I remember you mentioned you were directing seven different shows in seven different languages, and you were still directing us. And I'm like, yeah. So, wow, we're we're just <laughs> okay. Part of the echo. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there are others. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. usually send emails where I'm like, "Hey guys, I'm really busy." But that particular period, I, yeah, I couldn't remember what. I think everyone was asking me why they didn't have something yet, and it was that the, mm -hmm. the script wasn't done yet. And I was like, "Guys, mm -hmm. I'm not ignoring you. This is you're one of seven shows." <laughs> like, it's not, it's not that I don't like you. It's that yeah. actually, I don't have the script yet, and I actually can't focus yeah. on this right yeah. now. Um, yeah. But I didn't want you all to think yeah. I was blowing you off, because this cast is amazing. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm just hella busy. So what, what, is, what is the question exactly? Yeah, so for more context, Paula is our director on the show Iyanu, where Tiko and yeah. I get to play roles there. I get to play Iyanu, and Tiko plays Shiju, sorry, Teju. Shiju no, Shiju, actually. Yeah, Shiju's Shiju. the guy. Teju's oh, Shiju's the, girl. the guy. Teju. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Tiko yeah. also plays like nine other roles. He's one of my yeah. people where I just was like, nine I love him. Roles. I'm just going to keep using him. 
anyway. <laughs> like, well, that makes me do a lot of react and um, like, the screams like, and the... I'm like, uh, we'll just get to code. I just need... I'm, I'm going to call T-Code. The T-Code. warrior. Like, seriously, dude. Like, my utility player. Like, you've been a total rock star. Thank so, you, Paula. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I, I was going to ask that. How are you able to manage all these projects, you know, manage your time and um, still manage to be so pleasant? <laughs> well, um, thank you. Um, as far as like managing the projects, part of being a, a casting director and VO director is that I'm booked quite ahead of schedule because I'll be mm. working on a show for two or three years sometimes. Yeah. So my schedule is laid out very far in advance and then mm. things shift around stuff gets delayed a script isn't ready yet you know that sort of thing so it's a it's like i'm constantly moving chess pieces around on a board mm-hmm. trying to figure out how everything fits and i come from a production management background my degrees in production management like this is kind of the way i've been living for a long long time so mm-hmm. as my stomach growls which my microphone is probably picking up um because <laughs> apparently i didn't schedule lunch today so, um, <laughs> so, so, um, for me, it's less about the shows get made. Like it's not, I'm not balancing the national debt. I'm not solving world hunger. I'm making, I'm making cool stuff for kids to enjoy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the time management is more about managing my energy so that I can be pleasant mm-hmm. at every session. Mm-hmm. And so the back end, moving things around, scrambling when stuff isn't ready. Yes, that's annoying, but I just flex. And then it's about managing mm-hmm. how I respond to it that you guys see. That's the part you're seeing where I'm like, hey, I got to be honest with you. This is not going to happen. Or yes, this will happen a little bit early because I have the time. Or let's do this right now. That kind of thing. There's, a, there's such a thing as client management. And that's a separate mm-hmm. skill than production management and a separate skill than actor management. Client management is when I'm completely transparent about my process. So if I know that my team is going to deliver something ahead of schedule, I'll say, hey, would you like this three or four days early? We're, we're really, you know, kind of firing on all cylinders with it. I and mean, we can get it to you early and you can give us more notes. Would you like us to deliver it on time? Or I, I know pretty far in advance sometimes if something's going to take longer than I expected. Um, and so I'll say, hey, you all are asking for X, Y, Z change. That means that we're going to need four extra days. Are you comfortable with that? Mm-hmm. So I seem organized only because I'm very good at seeing the forest for the trees. And that's because I've been making shifts of that type professionally since 1997. So I have a lot of years of knowing what's not going to work and what is. Um, I wasn't born then. I know, right? Y'all make me feel <laughs> hella old. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for keeping it real. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so it's just, it's actually just practice. It's, it's actually just practice. You have to, you have to fail at it. And I've had some like spectacular failures, but y'all weren't born yet. So. <laughs> yeah, I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Tickled is like, Tickled is way older than I am. So. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, wait. <laughs> no, you're making me feel well, look, old. Like, look at you, like, spilling the tea on him. Like, he's hella old. <laughs> making me so feel shy. ancient. Thank you. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> no, but you're so cool. Like, nobody would actually be able to guess your age. I always thought you were in, like, your 30s. Thanks. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, so 30s. Just to confirm, is that you're when, not? Is that when, like, <laughs> being cool stops? Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like, I, I mean, you're, you're always just so relatable. It, it always feels like yeah, you're closer true. to us in age. Oh, true. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I'm, I'm quite a bit, quite a bit older than that. I'm not going to say how much cool. older. Just, <laughs> just know that I saw, I saw the original Star Wars in theaters without needing my parents. Ooh. Let's say. <laughs> Let's say oh, wow. <laughs> Now, this is some black don't crack thing because you don't even look like it. <laughs> Thanks. My. Oh, that's so, so cool. I, I, I want to put more, more um, context to this conversation because yeah. obviously we, we, we get along very well, Paula and, you know, Sarah and I. And as Sarah said, Sarah is the voice of Ianu and Sarah um, Paula is the voice director, you know, working on the project. And we've been working for about... Two years. Two now, years. Or? Yeah. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. Yeah. No, basically, two y'all are my family at this time. point. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Y'all yeah. Are my folks. Well, when are you going to come to Nigeria? I, I, I was well, going to ask that question. I really want to. Um, I'm hoping. 
I'm hoping I can convince the powers that be to allow come me to come for to the Abuja. premiere. Yeah, <laughs> like <that's laughs> really, I'm really proud of you guys, and it would be nice to be in a yeah. room so I can like yes. hug you and give you, you know, like you did it, you did it. <laughs> flowers in person. You know? I'm really proud of you guys. Yeah, I'm going to bring yeah. a bouquet of flowers for Paula. Oh, thank you. When that's when Yanu is out, guys, you get to understand all this all this noise we're making. Yeah, I'm, Paula I'm is proud. the I'm best. Not proud of you guys. I'm not proud. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Paula. So, Paula, you mentioned something, right? When you were talking, <clears throat> you said um, it's about managing your energy. Yeah. And that's how you're able to manage everything else, right? So, how do you do that? How are you able to manage your energy and prepare for really busy times and your response to those times or when things don't go according to your schedule? How are you able to manage your energy to, to manage that? Again, it's that, that thing of like, this is not. In the grand scheme of things, it's actually not that important, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, it, I want the show to be the best it can be. I want all the actors to have a blast. I want the directors mm. to be happy, the like directors of the, you know, like the showrunner, like Roy, for example. But I'm a, a cog in a wheel, and mm. I'd like to not be the squeaky part. So mm. um, managing my energy means, I used to teach kindergarten, and that particular skill is an exercise in patience. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's about like herding cats when you have 30 mm. people below the age of four or five who need your attention mm. all the time. And so I sort of take that into the way I direct, which is not that you're, you know, infants or children or anything, but the idea is that everyone is actually trying to do their best work. It's just everyone needs slightly different things in order to do that. And so I sort of suss out, this person needs lots more praise, this person needs quiet, this person needs time to sit with a note before I ask them to record. I try to figure those things out pretty early on in the process. So then it's about me knowing when I need to push and when I can sit back. And so, I mean, I do get angry, I do get frustrated. I just try not to take it out on the actors in the moment or let it flash out at the producers, especially on a call. During a session, I try to remain as even keeled as possible. Emails, occasionally I'll rip somebody's head off in an email. Um, you guys haven't experienced that because you're not at the client end, but occasionally at the client end, I will be like, hey, that was really uncool. Like that's not something we're gonna do with our cast or something you're gonna do with my team. But I, I, it's a, uh, I wish I had some like magical formula for energy management, <laughs> but it really is just that I, my goal is to get from point A to point B and I just keep it trucking. <laughs> I just keep going. Um, and I do, I mean, I really, I do get frustrated and I do get unhappy sometimes, but I would never let that spill out into the actual working space. Hmm. Occasionally I'll get on the phone with a producer or someone that I'm close with in the team and the two of us will just, ah! and then we put it away. <laughs> Yeah, because mm. that's not for public consumption. That's just us being frustrated about the process or mm. where we are at that moment. And then I do lots of things that aren't this to make sure that I do things, other things I enjoy so that I can um, enjoy. This is it. I was like, okay, we have an immersive view there. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> that was a bit of distraction. That was necessary. Right. I apologize. Good. <laughs> We're managing the space. I was like, um, hmm. okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's really just kind of about go do other things. I come back and do this. I go do other things. I come back and do this. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I don't have any magical formula. You just have to decide <laughs> that you have to decide how you're going to be in the world and, mm -hmm. and be that kind of without apology. And then that makes everything else easier. I guess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you know, I was just telling Tiko that I think one of one of the things that helps is the fact that you're very decisive in the moment. Yeah. I mean, I usually know what I want to hear. And I don't ever want to say actor do this, but I'm trying to lead you towards the thing I I know that moment mm -hmm. needs. And then sometimes an actor will come up with something wonderful that surprises me that I think is better. I mean, you've heard me say <clears throat> do this thing and then I'll be like you know what I hate the thing I was doing do the thing you were doing before <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah. that thing I've asked you to do actually doesn't work anymore so mm -hmm. I know what I want to hear but that's not always what's best for the moment so it's about mm -hmm. deciding yeah how to get you there and then recognizing that sometimes where I was going isn't always the best choice and I guess yeah. I am pretty decisive but it's also that I I hear the whole show in my head pretty immediately um yeah and I know what 
the showrunner wants next. I know mm -hmm. what's happening in the episode. You guys don't always have that information. I know what the storyboards look like, et cetera, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to mm -hmm. get us to a particular place emotionally that will then further the rest of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> the, you know, running, run, running Pep Squally, right? There's the creative part and there's the business part. So mm -hmm. how are you able to, like, bring those two parts together? I mean, in all honesty, the business part right now, especially in the children's content world, is actually for poo. It's actually really bad right now because so much children's content has been cut and there was sort of like a, a number of studios decided yeah. they weren't going to make any new things until 2026. Um, so this sort of this backlog of either projects that are that were already in the pipeline or projects that they're just sort of doing reboots of that's like suddenly why there's so many shows from your you know adolescents that are coming back is that it's, it's easier to go with a well-known mm. project than it is to bankroll a new show and have it not work so um yeah. the studios are really cautious right now and so for those of us that make stuff like my company it's actually been really difficult and so as a business person, there are these moments of like, okay, I'm just barely staying afloat. And then there's feast, you know, <laughs> it's feast or famine a little bit. Um, and I've learned to enjoy the feast and put a lot of it away because I never know quite what's going to happen famine wise. I'm a service work company primarily, at least my U.S. arm. So studios come to us and ask us to do stuff. And originally I used to have to really pimp and go to like all of the conferences and all of the cons and all that to get work. Um, I've had to do that less and less over the years, which is great because it's really tiring and it takes me away from the studio. So now more studios come to me and say, are you available? Which is nice. Um, if any studios are listening, yes, I'm available. And managing the business part is more about managing my team because sometimes because of the way we work, we seem like a bigger company than we are. And so people will come to us and be like, do this huge thing. And I'll say, meh, we can do that huge thing. But understand it's going to have to be broken up this way. And it's going to have to go around these four other things that are already on my schedule. I can't just add, you know, six more engineers and another director because we're not a big company. We're a small company. Um, the reason people like us is they get all this personal attention, but it's because we are a small company. So, uh, and not every studio wants that. Sometimes they want the sort of cookie cutter factory style just churn it out um type of production and some really want the hand holding and the can i call you any time of night and oh gosh you know i'm worried <laughs> because i think i dotted this i and crossed this t the wrong way and can you fix my script you know so we do more of that the sort of shepherding of a show from from thought process through um finished product which means that i'm often not available for some of the flashier stuff kind of, um, which yeah. is fine for me. I much prefer working on the, the, the smaller, like, you know, you're doing yeah, another show with me right now. It's a sweet story and not particularly like commercial in it, in its yeah. energy. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I'm but very I, sweet, very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> like I like the shows that make me yeah. feel good as a person. So that's what I'm always looking for. And that might not mm -hmm. be, I don't know, he man, <laughs> it might be <laughs> little girl in a truck on the road, you know, like some independent project that's just kind of beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like, so um, yeah. the business side is up and down like any small business. Um, and it's also up and down because I'm picky. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually picky. And I also want a quality of life for my team. I don't like when they're psychotically busy and then we are talking to each other <laughs> at 3 a.m. every night. Of the I'm like, no, like, go feed your kids, go to that baseball game, go take a break. Um, which is part of the reason I live in Europe, because in New York, <laughs> it was balls to the wall all the time. And I was like, this is not me. I'm going to go over here to Europe and have my weekends mm -hmm. off. Um, that was a deliberate choice. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I, so, <laughs> Tico? Yeah, I wanted something? to ask. Yeah, she said she mentioned, um, Paula, you did mention your, your peaky. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I, I think um, creatives will who enjoy creativity the, creativity the most, it allows them to decide on what they want to work on and enjoy it mm. and just give their all. Yeah. So that's a good quality. But let's bring that to Yanu. How, I was thinking the other day and telling myself, and I don't know if I mentioned it to you, Sarah, I, I was like, Paula, I believe you were the casting director. Yes. For bringing us on board. And yeah, you did, you did a brilliant job. Right. And I was thinking to myself, I said, 
for Pollard to have done this well, whoever whoever casted, I, in quote, if whoever casted Pollard for this job, <laughs> whoever brought her on for this job, also is a very good casting director. I just playing around with that, right? But then it was a, it was a great choice to have you do this job. So why did you decide to work on Iyanu? Um, Iyanu is not like the normal conventional white you know character yeah. that most of the you know western world is familiar with this is an african story yeah you're not an african i i guess <laughs> you know <No>. so <laughs> exactly so why did you choose to work with um roy on yano um i this is actually someone asked a similar question at comic-con this past weekend and it i was approached about it by one of the supervising producers um because we'd met through another colleague, through another, like it was one of those like telephone tag things and they really wanted to have a director of color. And I'd been directing like all the digital content for the Peanuts and Polly Pocket and Caillou and all this kind of stuff. And so I was sort of known in the kids space and we hopped on a Zoom call and they said, are you available in you know 2022? And I said, yeah, possibly. Cause it was like mid 2021, I think is when we're having the conversation. Um, didn't hear anything about it for a while and then got an email saying, okay, we're ready to go. And I was like, oh, we are. Okay. (laughs) And, and in it was the first two volumes of Roy's, um, graphic novel. Cause to that point it had just been a conversation about, Hey, we're doing this show. Would you be interested? But I really had no details. I didn't have any sense of it. And I, usually I will sit with material. I'll like say, thanks so much. I'll get back to you within the week. And I happened to have like a half an hour that afternoon so i open up the email and open up the first volume and I, there's a voice memo to my older brother and all it says is dude 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 i don't <laughs> care what chickens i have to sacrifice i'm gonna work on this show because i grew up in a part of the u.s where my family was like the only black family for decades wow. and so well there was there were a couple other black people but they were off the coast we were the only like mainland black people um and I hadn't ever had the, the images that I was seeing in the Yanu to grow up with. And there's that saying, like, you want to be the mentor, or the teacher, or the parent that you wish you'd had. And I was like, okay, here's a moment for me to create the kind of content that I wish I'd had. So it was actually not a, a difficult choice. I'd been pitching BIPOC projects at Kid Screen for years. I actually had, I called them the, the Pep Squally projects, and I would go every year with this, like, binder of shows by black creatives that I thought would be interesting to studios. And I would meet with them all and they'd be like, yeah, these are really cool, but we don't know if middle America will go for them. And I was like, you won't know till someone makes one of them. Like these are all excellent shows. You're just like not being brave. So the fact that there was a studio that was being brave enough to take this beyond (laughs) the pitching stage was really important to me. So it wasn't a hard decision. It wasn't, it wasn't like I went, oh, I wonder if I have any space on my schedule. My thought was I will clear space <laughs> on my schedule so that I can mm. be part of this. And I think it was a pretty darn good decision because y'all did a pretty excellent job with it. And it's been awesome directing you. <laughs> cool <Thank> beans. You. <laughs> yeah, awesome sauce. <laughs> yeah, y'all have been working with me a lot. I can tell. <laughs> all of my yeah. settings, all of my settings. Yes, we have all of them. That's so funny. <laughs> I, I, I'm outside and I'm like, yeah, awesome sauce. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, awesome you, you won't get it. Yeah. I, I want to... Okay, sorry, Sarah. I just I I I, I want to enter Go into on. more of what Paula yeah. does, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm talking about as a voice director. Um, before the podcast started, I and Paula, we're having this conversation about how the animation industry in Africa is still very young, and that means even for voice actors who are interested in animation in Africa, many of us don't get that opportunity because they are not even shows to work with in the first place mm-hmm. and so th- those of us on Yanu projects like Yanu Iwaju and stuff like that we're very um opportune right because there are very few in the continent and that also speaks to voice directing in a way so I really want us to talk about voice directing and help people understand majority of voiceover work in the continent 
majority is commercial um, commercial voice acting voice voiceover work and then you know you have narration documentary um, and maybe not audio even, drama yeah audio drama and then much later you count something like ivr animation is like i hope one day it's like a dream <laughs> mm -hmm. all right so let's let's dig into it let's talk about voice directing and how it comes to help animation or help voice voice actors work not many people have worked with voice directors due to not this. many people even and understand the need for a voice director the I've, need for I've, a voice i've seen yeah. way too many projects where the animator decides to be the one to direct it or they yeah. just get somebody that, you know this is what i want to hear and then they're just trying to play director and the project ends up <laughs> not so great and they, yeah. they they can't exactly say why and i'm like that's because you didn't use a professional voice director <laughs> no, so. <laughs> so so paula ju just take this as you're speaking to a continent that you want to help understand the role of a voice director what should we what do we need to know about voice directing? Okay, so, and I've had to tell people in the US this too, so it's not just continental <laughs> Africa. Um, so my job as a voice director is to take whatever the vision of the showrunner um, and the animation director is and, and make it actable. Because often what you're seeing on the page is some dialogue and some action. And as an actor, you hope that the actor will have made some decisions regarding the moment before and the moment after and where they are emotionally, but it's my job, and of course there are sirens, it's my job <laughs> to um, help the actor get from point A to point B and to move the story along. So, and to also be aware of what's happening farther along in the series and what's happened, what happened previously, because an, an actor can't always know that or keep it all in their head. The showrunner might even forget sometimes. They just have a lot going on. And so, I shepherd the characters through their journey and I shepherd each, shepherd each episode from its beginning point to its end point in a way that the story actually moves. I also shape the relationships between the characters. Um, I try to recognize the stakes of each episode. Often an actor will come in with an idea of what they think the episode is or what they think a scene is and I will have to sort of like clay mold them into what I know the show needs. And I also want to get multiple variations on that because I don't always know what the animation director has in their head. They have storyboards but there are transitions that are like, I need to give them enough that if they say, hey, I need this actually to be sadder, I can say, okay, well then let's use take four instead of take five. So I'm trying to like, it's like I've got a dial on a clock and I wanna have my, my noon, which is what I think they want. And then I've gotta do a nine o'clock and a three o'clock and some stuff in between so that there's some variance and some things for them to play with speed wise performatively. Frankenstein. Yeah, I got a Frankenstein. It. Yes, exactly. You, you hear me say that a lot. Like let's Frankenstein this take and this take because I think that's what they need, yeah. So my job is to shape the show, the show sonically because my prelay or the nat pause goes to the animators and that's what they animate to because that's how you animate the flap. So I'm actually directing the show usually right after the scripts are done, which is sometimes a full year before the animation team gets to work on it in its entirety. And along the way, things change. We discover, oh, hey, we need to add more dialogue or this relationship isn't working or this character is actually too old. We have to recast, you know, all those kind of things change. And so I come back in and make those adjustments re-edit, send the new nap pause. That goes off to the animators. Then it comes back to me for reacts. So I have a bank of reacts that I direct, which you guys have done hours and hours of reacts. But then I will also go through once I have the animation and say, okay, I don't have anything that will work here. Or this moment was just much bigger than I expected. So I need a bigger reaction here. And let's go back in and ADR that. Uh, so then I direct that. Then it goes back to the animation team and it's sort of a rinse repeat process until we get to where we feel like the voice and the visual match each other. So uh, it's a fun job. It's a hard job because I have to do a lot of, I have to try to think visually while directing sonically. And then I have to be in a lot of other people's heads. I have to be in Roy's head. I have to be in um, Darnell's head. Like these are different people. I have to be in Brandon's head, different people working on Iyanu because I have to know sort of, I have to deliver what I think they want before there's even pictures to go with it. 
and that and a lot of times they want different things so yeah. finding a, a middle ground yeah to find the middle ground exactly yeah you've been there for some of those discussions <laughs> yeah um and that's true no matter what show i'm directing um mm. and then when i'm directing a dub i'm trying to make it culturally specific so i'm working with different mm. casts in different languages and sometimes i'll say mm. would your character or would a kid this age react this way in mm. japan and the actress or actor will be like mm. not actually no I'm like, okay, well, we have to make this still work with the visual, but do what you would do as a seven-year-old in this situation in Japan, and let's see if we can find the happy medium. So there's a specificity about working with a voiceover director that gets lost if you're just like, go do it, actor, and I'll put some pictures on it. <laughs> it's why I hate AI voicing. I hate AI voicing, A, because taking my work, but B, it's, <laughs> it's distressingly not specific. And so... Everything sounds sort of like the McDonald's version of the food, of the audio, you know, like <laughs> the way you want it. But that's not actually, there's nothing, there's no heart behind it. Um, mm -hmm. There's also no resonance chamber, which from a sonic standpoint is like nails on the chalkboard of my soul. Because everyone, no matter <sighs> When I hear a voice, I know exactly what race the person is. And that's not about their vernacular or anything of that sort. It's that the, the different races resonate in a different place in their face. Yeah. And mm. so when you have an AI voice, there's, there's no resonance chamber. <laughs> mm. It really is McDonald's. It's the same true, no matter what true. country you go to. Yeah. Well, sort of, because you get slightly different things on the menu. But it's pretty much the same. There's like a... There's a Homoge homo yeah. homogeneity to to mm -hmm. the sound that I find really disturbing because I know I want the tapestry I want the difference I want this to sound like the world not like my computer so I can't even remember what the original question was I just wandered around <laughs> oh yes what does a voiceover director do so my job is to shepherd the show from its initial point to its end to shepherd the characters that way as well to create specificity in the reads choices for the animation directors and it's also really important to me that, this, that the projects sound like the world. So when I'm casting it, when I'm directing it, I'm trying to create this, this audio tapestry, this sonic variation. Because though you may all be from the same neighborhood and have the same sort of speech patterns and things, you don't all sound the same. So it's a matter of making sure that it feels like a world and not like I just have the same person voice mm. everybody has characters. a uniform sound it's just like if you were to watch game of thrones everybody looks a certain type of way or you know you were to hear something everybody has a similar kind of accent yes that sort of but thing. they but they they feel of the same world but they're not the same voice yeah mm -hmm. and so that's mm -hmm. what i'm trying to do with the audio as well yeah amazing you know okay we, sorry tico just, yeah, to, just, go to, on, to, please go just to add to what she said it just made me remember one time when I was watching something from, uh, I think it was Joe Coy, and he was talking about how different races have, um, d you know, you called it the resonance cham chamber, when they're speaking, where it comes from. And it was like, for the Japanese, it come from diaphragm. You know, <laughs> just on a lighter note, but yeah, and it made me realize that with Nigerians, we have where our speech comes from. And with every, every kind of person, like, there's there's where the speech comes from and yeah, yeah that goes uh, it, it goes uh it has to do a lot with how that world that you're trying to create putting it together and all of that yeah. yes yes <laughs> tico please carry on thank you so much paula for you know answering that question helping us understand better the world of a voice director it was a really uh, long-winded answer but thank you <laughs> <laughs> but it's good it's rich okay. yeah um, absolutely yeah. And like I, I, we've got a couple of voice directors. Um, one of the ones I always would shout out to is Remy Olutimai, um, who happens to be yeah. West Africa's first voice director for animation. Mm -hmm. He's done a couple of stuff and is an amazing person as well. And it's interesting when I work with voice directors, the way you guys think, you are very, very vast in knowledge. And it's, it's, a, it's an amazing world world and i feel like it takes some specific skill set sets <laughs> yeah. to thrive as a voice director so if i want to be a voice director what what advice would you give to me what are the things you tell me to look out for things i should listen to pay attention to are there books to read are there activities what do i study in school and things like that my voice director friends and i all come from different backgrounds interestingly enough there's like there's not a way you become a voice director a lot of us came from theater 
either as theater actors or theater directors or mm. production managers like me, stage managers. Several of my voice director friends came from dance, strangely. Some come from um, theater improv or comedian, like stand-up comedian backgrounds. Almost all of us have, that's actually, I was thinking like, what is a three line? Almost all of us have live performance experience. All of us, almost all of us come from that world. Not always, um, not the same live performance experience, but all of us have worked in live performance of some sort. And so we're accustomed to working with large casts. We're accustomed to sending our acting choices out beyond the lights. Voiceover is a strange thing in that it's actually closer to theater than it is film, though you're making it for a visual medium. So the majority of the actors I work with have theater experience, especially my US and, and European actors. A lot of them are primarily musical theater performers or do a lot of improv theater. And this is because um, I'm constantly asking for alts. I'm constantly asking for, you know, do this three different ways. I'm constantly asking for flexibility in the moment. And that comes from a theater background, a film background. They're going to move the camera nine times. You're going to have to sit around and wait. You're going to get that one good shot. You might do 10 takes of it if, you're, if your director is frustrating. <laughs> um, but they're looking for one specific thing, whereas in theater, in dance, in stand-up comedy, in voiceover, we're actually looking for multiple things that could work. You're constantly shaping and changing and trying and, and iterating. And so it's actually a different skill. So as a, if you want to go into voiceover direction, I recommend taking a bunch of acting classes, take scene study, take theater improv, uh, take dance. It actually really helps if you're directing. If you have a dance background, it, it helps to understand how character moves, what that does to the body mm -hmm. in space. Um, so you know if a character is jumping while saying a word, what that should sound like you know what that does to the body physically take some commercial classes you can shadow somebody i would recommend shadow an engineer in a studio just to watch what they're doing on the back end this is something that my engineers tell me all the time they're like it's so nice when you're directing because you give us time to actually do the engineering some voice directors just plow through and then we're scrambling to keep up but i'm aware of how long it takes to move something in place i'm aware of how long it takes to edit something so a client can hear it i'm aware of, because i used to do it so i don't so much anymore because i have a team to do it for me <laughs> but um but i used to do that too so i'm aware of if i'm asking i mean you've heard me say to roger who's my wonderful engineer roger midway <laughs> like shout out roger yeah roger's a man <laughs> Could you do this? I know it's a pain in the butt, but can you do it? Because I know that he's going to have to like basically play the piano for the next 15 seconds so that my client can hear something. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and it requires switching over the, the tracks and like shifting the busing. Like it's just a lot of stuff so that a client can hear whether that uh, was better than the uh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, so yeah, a combo of engineering and live action training will do you a solid. Um, and then plan to start not in voiceover direction. I didn't start as a voiceover director. I started as a production manager who then directed musicals and choreographed musicals for several years, who then became an associate producer at a dubbing house, who then became a voiceover director. So it was started my professional career as a production stage manager in 1997. And I started my dubbing career as a performer in 2004 and switched to being a producer in 2011 and then opened my own company in 2014. So it was a long journey to get to the point where I was able to say, yes, I am a voiceover director and this is my work. Yeah. It does not happen instantly. <laughs> so just know that it's a, it's a process of building up the skill to recognize when a, sh a session is going to take longer to understand how to talk with a client, to um, have a portfolio big enough that you get people to notice you. Yeah. Um, it's a process like anything else. That's deep. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you, yeah. you went through the process. And I, I think, <laughs> Thank you. yeah, Thank you. that's something that say a lot of you know our generation and i think it's just the way the world is moving people want things done very fast they want to get mm -hmm. this I, I, you know somebody's going to start 
taunting themselves or like putting themselves out there as I'm a voice director, I'm a voice director without getting the necessary experience. And we see this even in voiceover and everything, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, let's talk. Okay, Sarah, I know you've got a I couple a of question. questions. <laughs> yeah, please do ask. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, still on the people just waking up tomorrow and going, I'm a voice director and they don't even know how to even manage people to begin with. So you mm. just have, you just have them just, uh, Anyway, yeah, I, I'm glad you gave, you know, that little talk about, you know, what it actually means to voice direct and what's necessary to be a voice director. So um, I was going to ask, you know, you said something about having background in sound design and knowing how that works. So I wanted to ask if that usually influences your casting choices. Ah, so... My casting choices are actually not so much influenced by what I know is going to have to happen technically, but by what I want the experience to feel like. Working on an animated series, if you're an actor and a director and a video director, is a marriage because it's going to be years. Mm. And if you're lucky, it's like The Simpsons and it's like, you know, 28 years or whatever. Yeah. So... I'm listening for actors who make good choices when I'm casting. I'm listening for actors who have good equipment, since often I'm um, directing people from their home studios now, especially post-pandemic. It used to be that everyone came to my studio in New York, but there's no reason for that anymore. So I can cast a much wider group of people, which is great. But I'm also, and I'm listening for the tapestry that I've talked about repeatedly. But once I get to the callback stage, I'm also listening for whether the person is kind. Have our interactions via email been pleasant? Have I heard good things about the actors? Because I'll reach out and ask if I see it, you know, if I Google stock the actor, which I do often, um, when we're getting close to casting, I'll look up what else they've done. And invariably, there's someone that I know, even if tangentially, who's worked with them. And I ask, you know, how, what was your experience? Because I'm trying to create a group of people that will actually want to come record with each other four or five times a month sometimes, yeah? If it's miserable to show up to work, people don't show up with their best selves and then I don't get the best work. Mm. So I have to make my choices. I make my first choice based on whether the actor paid attention. That's my first cut. Did you actually do what I asked for in the audition? And that's from how you named the file to how you sent the email back. Because I usually am that specific. If they don't take my instruction, my written instruction, they're not going to take my verbal one. So my first cut is, mm. did you even follow the instructions mm -hmm. and then it's talent and then it's what the world needs and then it's whether the person is is decent in their interactions with me because um, mm -hmm. I've had some wonderful actors who were just unpleasant like and unpleasant is not like you know I'm just having a bad day or whatever but un unpleasant in that they were quite condescending or demanded that um, I list my credentials or my agent hasn't heard of you, so I'm going to you know, forge you to them because I don't deal with anyone that's not XYZ level, you know, that kind of stuff. That's happened less and less over the years, but it happens enough that I'm quite like, ooh, hmm. Um, I've had to cut actors because their agents were unpleasant, which is unfortunate. And I've wanted to say to the actor, you know, your agent's going to lose you work because they were really, really difficult to deal with. Um, I try not to do that. But occasionally, if, if I know someone who knows that actor, I'll say, hey, this was my experience with their agent. You want to put a, a bee in their bonnet and let them know that their agent is actually doing them a disservice. So yeah, that's kind of how I'm building a cast. And what I'm looking for is talented people who are also decent people. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. What, what are complete pet peeves when auditioning someone or working with them? Um... When auditioning, again, it's the not following instructions. And that's not because I, mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. But I'm often receiving over a thousand auditions. It's common for me to receive anywhere from 800 to 1400 auditions for a project. That's pretty standard. Yeah. And so if I've said, please don't do X, Y, Z, please label your file this way and please send it this way. And the person has done none of those things. <laughs> A, it means extra work for me. And B, it means I can't trust you. I want to trust you mm. immediately. Your job as an actor is to make me go, yeah, they've got their shit together. Pardon my language. I can 
-hmm. I can trust them. Yeah. You have to make me feel calm enough to introduce you to the producers mm. because your audition reflects on me as a casting director and me as a VO director. You are my ambassador for the next 15 seconds. You know what I mean? So not following instructions. I talked a little bit about this with, at the voice of a workshop, the actors who, who stalk me, who like will send me their audition by email and then also send it via Facebook and also send it via LinkedIn and also send it like anywhere they can find me. I don't particularly like that because it just feels a little creepy. And some people will, will overshare, like they'll send me their audition, but they'll also send me videos of their last 10 projects, a picture of their dog. One guy sent me his entire photo album of his family, like just like, <laughs> like really too much information. I didn't ask for all that, I asked for an audition. Or people who wanna have a conversation with me. And that's not actually a pet peeve, it's just I feel a little bit bad that I can't give them the kind of handholding they need. But they'll send in a file, I'll say thank you, and then it, it's like the floodgates open. Oh my God, you responded, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, no, no, sweetie. I'm responding to 1,400 other people in exactly the same way. It's a copy paste, thank you. It literally says, thank you. That's all, <laughs> you know? Um, so as an actor, you're, you are in this weird cycle of put yourself out there, get rejected, put yourself out there, get rejected, put yourself out there, get rejected, put yourself out there, get accepted, put yourself out there, get rejected, yeah? And so sometimes I feel actors desperately want someone to accept them and so if i do anything that's remotely kind <laughs> just because i think it's decent it's like oh she was kind ah! and then i sort of get sort of like like a golden retriever puppy that's just like love me love me love me and i i don't have time to love you that way yeah um so those are things that i'm like hmm about and in sessions this is a this is a skill this is actually a skill and it comes from doing more and more recording sessions you actually get better at it there's an actor that i love working with named rob Moreira. um i've worked with him quite a lot for many many years and he's excellent at this which is reading the energy of the session he knows when he can joke and he knows when he needs to shut up and just wait because everyone's trying to make decisions some actors you'll end a recording and they'll just keep like talking and talking and joshing and like trying to keep their energy up kind of, but it's a sonic medium. So if they're talking, everyone's hearing them, everyone's involved in it. And sometimes I'll have to type to Roger and just say, you know, mute them because we, we actually need quiet on the line so that the producers and I can discuss this because we're often back channeling or we're actually even discussing it in real time there because it's not something that we are worried about the actors hearing. But then there's one actor who's just like popping in and joking and joking and joking and joking. And it's like, no, wait, wait, wait. We actually have to make a decision. So you have to be quiet for a second. So you have to be willing to, to turn your actor energy on and off um, and be aware of when to turn it on and when to turn it off. Uh, but that comes with practice, like learning to read the sort of the energy of the session. Those are the, that's something that I dislike in a session is when an actor can't figure out how to be. Um, how to just be, how to mm -hmm. just be confident that they've made a decision and now we're making a decision and now we're going to tell them what the decision is. You actually have to just be confident, like make a choice and stick with it and then see what happens. The flip side of that is people who make a choice and then won't deviate. And that's difficult too. When I'm like, okay, can you, you did a great take of that laughing. Can you do one where she's crying and they still laugh? I'm like, no, not laugh crying, just crying okay we got you to sound like you're laughing sadly but can you cry <laughs> yeah not being able to flex in the moment that's also difficult because then the producers are like well what are we supposed to do with this and that's when i get calls like have you considered recasting and that always makes me sad because if the actor can't take direction i can't actually direct them and i try to give actable notes like someone might a producer might say i need this 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 and this and i say you actually just want the actor to talk slower right oh yeah please talk slower. You know, like I try to give things that are actionable, but if the actor can't do that, then it leaves me in a weird spot. So the two things are during sessions, at least either ignoring my direction totally or being so into your own head that you're not paying attention to the actual energy of the session itself. Well, that's insightful. <laughs> Sarah, very, isn't very. it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's taken me to, you know, I, I feel like I want to know more from Paula's perspective, having worked with 
And I, Paul, I, I stand to be corrected, but we're probably the first set of Nigerians or even Africans that you've had to work with, you know, at this spectrum. Well, this right? amount, this number of people. Yeah, yeah. this number, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. in one particular project. Yeah. And that, I believe, had its own revelation for you because now you're having to... I'll give you an example. Um, the fact that we're, we're all in different regions and we're trying to grapple with getting our recordings right and we have electricity issues and, you know, things like that. Data issues, like... for literally sometimes our network is down all over the country yeah. yes yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> things happen I, I i recall um i think that was was it last year i think or this year there was one time we had a session and later on you had to tell me that you could hear my room or you could hear some noise in the background and i had to upgrade and upgrade <laughs> until i I yeah. got to the point I even got new mics, new headphones. You did so much work. It was, it was wonderful <laughs> of you. It was very kind of you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would like you to speak to us. If you could talk to all of the like, cast of Ianu, there are things that, of course, you could commend us for. And there are things that, you know, this is an opportunity to say, oh, you guys can do better at this. It doesn't have to be specific. It could be general. It could. All, I mean, of course, like I'm just saying that if you had the opportunity to talk to all of us from this experience, what are the things you would tell us to work on? What are the things you'll encourage us to do better? And what are the things you've observed about us that makes us unique, all right? Yeah. Wow, okay, that's a question, yo. In all honesty, this cast of Iyanu, um, y'all y'all pretty much brought it. Like I don't, it's a huge cast. It was, this was like, this cast was huge. And you got better and better. Like you actually got better so had you asked me this question after episode four i might have been like well y'all need to do blah but after x number of episodes which i'm not allowed to say by the way every time you came in the booth all of you had improved like noticeably episode nine there's a episode nine was the first episode where i was like there we are because it was like all of you dropped into your characters and you figured out how you wanted to be and you figured out the story and you were really clear about yourselves. And it, not that episodes one through eight aren't excellent. They are. I'm really proud of you. But episode nine was the first time where I was giving shaping notes, not acting notes, where I was taking your performances and just sort of molding them as opposed to being like, no, I really need you to sound like you're running. <laughs> you know, it was like almost <laughs> everyone sort of got it. Finally, I think if I had to ask for things, I would love it. And this is for anyone, not just the Anu cast. Do your homework a little bit. Um, showing up, having just read the script a couple minutes before, just so you know what's going on in your scene is not enough. You actually have to read the whole episode, know where you are in space, make a vocal choice, be prepared to play. Sometimes the first read through, there would be three actors who were totally bringing it and one actor who it sounded like they were just seeing the text for the first time, <laughs> you know? And I'd be like, mm, what are you doing? I remember we had an episode like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was like, did you? I was like, oh no. Yeah. And unfortunately, if that happens in multiple episodes, I just recast. Because though I love my cats i'm my my responsibility is to make the best show i can and so i'm a little bit draconian if after your third session with me you are still where you were at the first session i gotta jump i gotta bounce so i expect my actors to show up and bring it and that requires some preparation on on your part yeah so i want you to show up prepared <laughs> read the script get clear about where you are in space and that reading the script and getting clear where you are in space is about the moment before. So if the, the scene starts and the direction says John runs in from outside, it's pouring rain and he's crying. And you start the scene calm, not out of breath, no tears. I know you didn't do your homework. And then it's on me as the voiceover director to have to bring you to the place you needed to be emotionally. And that's kind of not cool like it's it doesn't do the showrunner it, it does a disservice to the showrunner and to your fellow actors um and it wastes time simply because you didn't read read before you show up pay attention so that's something that i want all actors to do whether they're in Yanu or not um 
and also to be flexible because I will ask for changes. I will ask for new things. I will ask for a million of something. If I say three in a row, give me three different things in a row, not the same thing three times in a row. That's the funniest thing when I'm like, can I have three in a row of this sound? And then someone will go, uh, uh, uh. I'm like, no. No, I actually need some variation. So I want... I want you to be an actor. Yes, you're you're voicing a project, but I need you to be the actor before the voiceover artist. And that's a, it's an interesting thing. A lot of people are like, I, I do voices. My friends say I should be a voiceover artist. I'm like, but can you act? What do you mean? Can you act? Can you make choices in the moment? Can you make that voice fit? <laughs> Yet more sirens, sorry y'all. Can you make that <laughs> voice fit? this moment and it's great that you want to sound like a baby and that you make a good baby but i'm looking at a 14 year old girl how's that gonna help me you know <laughs> you know what i mean so i need you to be able to flex both performatively and vocally and that takes mm -hmm. practice oh another thing take singing lessons even if you can't sing even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid just knowing where you need to take a breath knowing how much air you need is incredibly helpful. Um, because sometimes I'll get actors in the booth who make great choices, but they all sound like they're about to run out of air. <laughs> you know? And you're like, wait, wait, girl, just, just take a breath before the end and then you can get to the end of the sentence. Yes. Yeah? So you have to know your own instrument um, well enough to be able to use it all of the time. Wow. Uh, that, that's so good. And I don't think I have any questions anymore. <laughs> um, I may just throw a comment in the middle of everything, which is that um, I also want to say a very big thank you, Paula, for how you allowed us as Nigerians to be Nigerians. <laughs> 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 you know what I'm talking about? Well, that, was, that was a mandate from Roy as well. Um, he really wanted the show yeah. to, to sound mm -hmm. like... <laughs> Nigeria. Absolutely. And so we would have discussions where, I mean, you heard us in our sessions, like I would ask for a read and he'd be like, mm, I was like too American. Yeah, mm. I'm like, all right, let's yeah. do a not an American read. Yeah. And it took me a little like, while. Please to... keep your American passport. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, so it was really, I had to learn also. I mean, thank you guys for being patient with me because sometimes I'd ask for something and I'd hear the room kind of be like, and this moment was brought to you by Mack truck, you know, like, I was like, okay. <laughs> That's not something that will fly in Nigeria. And we'd be like, we wouldn't do that. I'm like, all right, never mind, never mind. So I learned, um, and you allowed me to learn, which I appreciate very yeah. much. Thank you um, so much for that, because many yeah. times, sorry to cut you. No, no, please. Uh, many times we've had cases of shows that they try so hard to, uh, they say it's a Nigerian show. They say it's about Nigerians, but it sounds nothing like us. Yeah. And, you know, growing up, the kind of cartoons and media we had was either American, you know, mm -hmm. just Western, or yeah. trying to be Nigerian. So I, I feel so confident because this is one of the shows where we sound exactly <laughs> like yeah. us. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. It's just such a joy. Thank cool. you. For, Thank you. For yeah. Allowing I that. <laughs> Yeah, and I just want to yeah. add to what you just said, Sarah. It's a, it's also important for us to understand why we got to this point. Because, mm -hmm. again, that brings us back to the fact that we've not had the animation industry in a you know matured state compared to what mm -hmm. we've gotten in the West. So mm -hmm. most of the animation that we grew up consuming, they were very, very Western. Yeah. So yeah. our idea... Our default idea of what animation should sound like, if you just meet any random voice actor and say, oh, I want you to voice, voice. They're, Yeah, they're doing a character voice that mm -hmm. mimics a foreign character. Right. And for me, while that is interesting to, to see how creative and cartoonish it sounds, mm -hmm. I always maintain that it doesn't represent us right yeah. and i i i, I clam or I, I push for people trying to study and understanding uh, on the study the the voice the characters and the voices that we have in africa yes so mm -hmm. i'll say things like who is learning pigeon like we studying the bus conductor to, right. to understand how he speaks the right. rough and you know we we paying attention to the hunter we paying attention to the person like this is the reality of 
our space mm -hmm. and we need to be able to express it so shout out to um iyanu shout out to roy, roy. and you and everybody who, <laughs> who gave us the opportunity to display nigeria and africa the way it is thank awesome you sauce. <laughs> awesome sauce yeah cool beans cool beans <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Sarah, at this point, I just leave it to you. Um, if you have okay. any question, and if not, uh, you know, it's been a great conversation. <laughs> um, yeah, I just have, I think, just one or two more questions. Okay. And yeah, the, the, the first one is it's about trends in the animation industry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Have you seen trends in animation voice casting? evolve over the years and what do you see emerging in the near future um this is interesting there was this like liminal space <laughs> around 2021 20, where everyone was like we're gonna have ethnic actors voice ethnic characters and it's gonna be ethnic um and that lasted like 18 months or so <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why I call it a liminal space. It was just like the in-between. The interesting thing about the animation industry is that I cannot figure out, I never know what's going on. And I know that sounds weird, but I really never know what's going to come to me. I mean, there's some things that are always there. There's always like the Ben Tens and the Rusty Rivets and the like mm -hmm. random Midwestern kid who has superpowers. That's like a, you know, um, that sells. And then there's the random Midwestern kid that has superpowers, but disguised as like a dog or, <laughs> or whatever, you know? <laughs> I don't know. And I don't know, especially because I'm starting to work on more and more European productions, which have a very different feeling and a very different idea of the kind of casting they want and a larger breadth creatively. And so I don't actually know what the trends are. I know that one of the things I got a little bit frustrated with was that I would be asked to cast projects for people and they would want a diverse cast and then the cast would be racially diverse, but they'd actually all sound the same still. So it was like, well, we, we can say that we have a black actress and an Asian actress and, an, and a Hispanic actor, but they all sounded like they were from Ohio. And so the very thing that made them special was sort of killed off in the way that the show was directed, because I wasn't always directing those. And I was like, but wouldn't it be more interesting if you just let her have her Hispanic accent? Which she, you know takes away when she does voiceover, but when she just chats with me, she's clearly from the Bronx <laughs> and sounds Puerto Rican. <laughs> like she's Latinx, so Latina, like can we can we just keep that? Oh no, no, no. It's like, but why why hire a Latinx mm -hmm. actress if you're gonna not honor the way she sounds when she's not in the booth. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So and then I would get requests to make the cast sound, everyone sounds the same, they would say. And I was like, yeah, but you wrote a character that sounds like every other character ever. If you want this person to sound different, ask for something other than Ben 10 or Rusty Rivet. <laughs> you know what I mean? So there isn't a trend, but I'm noticing some companies, my own included, that are actively trying to, to make more of the world apparent in the choices we make. Um, in our projects and in how we voice them. So it's better than it was, but it still has a ways to go. I, I just have one more. Like, this has been such an insightful conversation. So thank you for having me, you guys. This has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for being here. So what is like the biggest challenge you've ever faced as a casting director? And how- Biggest challenge I've ever faced? Um, I mean, Iyana was pretty tough. I think. Why? Um, just because Roy had a very specific sound he was looking for. Mm -hmm. And a lot, and I had a lot of talent that did not have access to good equipment. So I was having to gamble on what they actually sounded like because I wasn't actually hearing it. I was getting voice memos recorded to cell phones, you know, babies crying in the background, the refrigerator running, people who had recorded direct to their laptop when the fan was on, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. It was actually really hard to just sort of know how people actually sounded. I do a lot of guessing. My neighbor's parakeet is so loud right now. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I cast a children's show back in 2017 
and it was a very popular children's show. The problem with the show is that once the kids age out, I have to recast, and I did it for several years. And so for several years, I had to fire children. When you fire children, you also fire their parents. And so every time a new season came around, I'd have to be like, okay, who has aged out? And I'd have to listen to them. What I would do is call them and just be like, hey, just checking in, so I could hear the kids talk because their voices changed. They were children, even the girls, you know? So that was challenging in that I saw so many kids, so many kids, and I had this days, days of callbacks. And some of the kids were excellent actors, but there was one little girl, oh, she was so lovely. Her, her audition was brilliant, her audition was brilliant. And I brought her into the studio to do an ensemble callback. This is when I was still in New York, full time. She was so tiny that we had to lift her up onto the stool, and then, the six actors were all together and they all started to read and it came to her line and she just sat there happily swinging her feet. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a long pause and I said, it's your turn now. That's your line. And, and she went, okay, I should say my first line. And I said, yeah. And so she said the first line from the audition. And I said, no, no, no the first line from the, the copy you're looking at. And she just looked at me blankly and I said, sweetie, can you read? And she said, no. So she was four. She was four. And I knew she was young, but her audition was so good that I was like, well, I'll bring her. She literally just couldn't read. And so the other actors in the booth who were at seven, eight, nine, ten, were like, yeah. And I said, does anyone That's want to help her? And they said, <laughs> we'll help her. And they were all very sweet. And they would tell her what her line was. And then she would deliver an amazing performance of it. Like she was an wow. excellent actress, but she couldn't read the copy. And <laughs> so the producers who were in the control room with me, all of us yeah. are like, that was great. And that group went away and they were like, wait, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, I don't know. Her acting is so good, but I don't know if we can do that for the next 26 episodes. I don't know if we can wow. do that. And I sincerely hope this little girl was still acting because at four, she made brilliant choices, absolutely excellent choices, but she couldn't read yet. And <laughs> so I couldn't hand her a script or like trust that she could do an entire 22 minute episode that, you know, it was... So those kinds of, that, that particular show was probably the most challenging just because it was so many children and so many parents and so much turnover. Um, and it was sad to lose those kids because I would become like, they always, Miss Paula, we're here. They all called me Miss Paula. They were all the sweetest. Every cast, Miss Paula, Miss Paula. Um, they were little kids. Um, and I have to say, you're, you're too old now. Sorry. I am. Yeah. Put your mama on the phone. I'll talk with your mama. And I would have to uh -huh. say, I'm sorry, we, you know, and it was just, they were like my little family for a year and then they grew up every year. Wow. Yeah. So that show was hard just cause it was like a lot of turnover and a lot of disappointing little people. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can so imagine how bad you felt. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not it, my fault. Wow. Yeah. Hormones, kid hormones. Yeah. yeah. So that was hard. That was, wow. that was probably the most difficult just because it was a lot of casting because I was always yeah. having to look for a new mm -hmm. cast and then a lot of mm -hmm. disappointing children and their parents. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. So do you have any wow. memorable experience working with any voice artists in any particular project? Like really memorable. I, I mean, I think this, this is pretty memorable, you know, this having a little actually. girl. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, I mean, I've had really positive experiences. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting, the actors have always just been lovely. Um, I've been really lucky that way. I've had really lovely actors. I've had some weird show issues. There was one show where the producer got arrested during the session and taken what? out of the building. He was in another building phoning in. That was wild. That was wild. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that whole show was strange. I had one show, oh God this wonderful, wonderful musical show. We had the most amazing cast. We had like two people from Broadway. We had a Grammy winner. I mean, like the cast was amazing and they all sang and it was such a good cast. And the series creator and the studio got in a fight and they cut the show while we were in the booth recording like the fourth or fifth episode. And so I had to tell all these incredibly famous singers that the show had been pulled. And it sucked because it's unfortunate to lose income, but it sucked because those were f 
It was five really brilliant musicians who were actually just enjoying working together. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know when they'd have the chance to do that kind of work together again. So they were actually just genuinely like, I've had such a blast like making music with you and now we can't. Um, Cause they all you know, went back to their own lives, got scattered to the winds. So that one was, a, that was a disappointing one. But then the recording sessions for that, like you could tell them anything and they would all riff and play and like the musicality on that, like the, just the musicianship on that show was phenomenal. And I'll be forever sad that no one got to hear any of it because they were six or seven songs that were recorded that were just freaking brilliant. So yeah, so I've had some like disappointments, but those were usually up at the client end, never at the act. Wow. I, I think, you know, yeah, I mean, you, I, I would camp Paula and ask her all the questions in the world. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't allow. And yeah, I think, yeah. I think for now, you know, yeah. that's all. <laughs> okay. Thank you both for having me. It was very cool to get your, your email and, and get the invitation. I really appreciate it very much. And thank you for being. Do you thank know, you for fun up. fact, hmm. Paula is the first non African to be on the Everything Voice of Us podcast. That's true. Yeah. And yeah. we've had, um, yeah, we've had 50, yeah, that's true. 54 episodes. This is the 54th episode. Wow, y'all. Good for you. <laughs> wow. Well, thank so you. So congratulations, Paula. Thank you, <laughs> yes. cool. thank you thank so you, much. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been a great um, conversation. And trust me, guys, spring next year, you're going to be seeing Yanu for yourself and you will understand the beauty we've been talking about for the past yep. one hour plus. Yep. Um, just before we go, I know there are a couple of things that um, Paula is involved in and I'm excited to plug it in the podcast. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. So, so let's get talking about them. We could start with the one in Nigeria. I know you've got um, an engagement with the Voice of a Workshop and Media, mm -hmm. which is a Voice of our institution of learning in nigeria so you could start with that and then your personal projects and things you're doing you know we we'll, we'll want to know about that before we round off cool um so i am doing a five session course on narrative podcasts and how to handle yourself during sessions how to audition how to position yourself in the market um, with the voiceover workshop. So I hope people will join me for that. It starts in mid-november. What else is going on? A couple of people have asked me recently if I would start producing voiceover reels. So if you're feeling uncertain about your voiceover reel, feel free to reach out. Um, since so many people are asking me, <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> apparently that's something I need to do. Um, wow. So I'll help you choose copy, um, direct you through your process, sound oh, design nice. it so it sounds like you've done different spots. <laughs> There's nothing worse than getting a voiceover reel where it sounds like it's all recorded in the same studio. Um, so I want it to sound like you've got actual spots. So we'll help master it and um, mix it and master it so it sounds like you've got multiple projects. Um, and that is something that enough people have asked me to do that I feel like, okay, I should probably start doing this. Because what I usually do is just give people ways to fix their reels, but everyone's like, but can you do it? <laughs> okay, all right. So feel free to reach out. I'll squeeze it in around stuff. And then I, of course, have two careers. We didn't really talk about my second career because it's not <laughs> audio related, but I'm... I teach dance and tour and quite a bit. Um, so uh, if you want to come learn some dance, I'm running a dance festival in March in Portugal. So just check me up on Instagram. You can see both my podcast stuff and my dance stuff there at pdubs2020. Um, let me know what you're up to as well. And that's, that's what's going on. Sweet. That's it. <laughs> By the way, have you that's seen Paula dance? I, I can't wait. I, it, oh Sarah, God. have you seen Paula dance? Yes, I have. <laughs> you need to Only show me. Uh, go out you and stalk her Instagram. Me. She's oh. such a good dancer. Oh my God, thank you. Oh. I, I mostly oh. teach now. I'm I'm mostly retired. So thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you. But still, I, wow. And I see her students, and and the, like sometimes, I, whenever I bump into one of her posts, I just open and I'm like, oh my God, that is so cool. <laughs> Because I can't dance, wow. so I'm always really excited to see people who can. And I'm just like, that is so cool. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I, people always say I look like I can dance, but I can't. <laughs> I'm sure you can. You just I haven't found I your style yet. Can. That's all. 
Yeah, everybody can. See, Aww. Everybody can. Coming There's from the dance Paulette. instructor in her. Everybody can dance. It's in there. It's in there, yo. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can. I I just sometimes feel like I'm I'm tall, six four, so it may look awkward sometimes. <laughs> No, no. But I, I do I do a good job, a decent job at dancing. Good. Well, good. Then y'all need to come to the festival. Just saying. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> we should. Do you know, I, do you know, I really love Portugal. Yeah, good. I mean, with I the do whole Japa Fiva in the air in Nigeria, like Portugal has always been one of the places that, because it's so ancient and modern at the same time. Yeah, it's a very So I was place. really excited. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, she lives in Portugal. I, I've been reading about this. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Come I'm hang. I'm jealous <laughs> Come of hang. your living in Portugal. <laughs> but I should visit sometime soon. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we have to visit each other, clearly. So Absolutely. Yeah. I can't wait to have Paula in Nigeria. <laughs> yes. You yes. Know. So it's you said a little something about a premiere. Yeah, I think I, premiere. I, I have no idea how that's, if it's going to happen or not. I'm just putting it out there in the world. So I figure <laughs> if I say it enough times, someone will pay attention. Yay! <laughs> I, 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 like there's going to be a premiere in Nigeria, so. right? There's going to be a premiere. Duh. There there's has be, to be. There has to be, yeah. And but then we, should, will, like, we will bring you here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea what their together. plans are. Yeah, it's, it's very much in the hands of it's Lion Forge and everybody. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Oh my, cool. it's been such a beautiful <laughs> such a episode. Thank Speaking you guys. with the sweetest Paula Gammon. I mean, thank you so much, Paula, for being here <laughs> with us. All right, so this is it for the uh, podcast today. Um, thanks to you, Sarah my host while I play co-host <laughs> oh yeah well thank but you now for I'm running off. the wheel T-code yeah. it's been such a great yeah. time so we're just, yeah so we're just passing the button now because I'm rounding off so, <laughs> anyway uh, I just want to also yeah I want to add to it that um, we've got a a, a, a link in the show notes that says show me love so if you want to support the podcast um, please feel free to support donate and uh, it helps us keep the podcast running we appreciate so much and please do well to like subscribe comment if you're watching on youtube and share tell somebody about the podcast because this is one place that you can be sure of getting voiceover related content Absolutely. meaningful insightful stuff every week and that's what we do right here at the everything voice of us podcast the african perspective it's been a pleasure and i am t code sarah thank you and paula gamon yes. wilson a fabulous voice director till next I'll week guys next time. thank you so much all. see you again <laughs> bye <Have fun. laughs>